response very quickly in the clinic, 2D, by positioning 3D brackets. And then he'll send the, the after he started the initial movements and, and got some gross movements going and some leveling, um, when he needs the talk and, and the finer details, he'll send a scan of the brackets in the mouth. What's happening here? You'll send a scan of the brackets in the mouth to Sure Smile, and they will make the wires. But you know they do have a fixed charge for these wires. You can have as many wires as you like, but it is over a thousand pounds for the wires. Uh, I was told that recently from one of uh, the doctors in the UK. Um, and this this is overkill, as far as I'm concerned. This was for a GP in the UK, and who does very good lingual work. He's done ten years. Of, of lingual work and and we tried something new and he wanted 2d bonding but he wanted me to make a setup the reason for the setup was to predict the arch form and and and, and whether we need an ipr anywhere what, you know what we can do because that's what setups do they they give you information about your case and some doctors don't want to do them because they they know that they can work without them through experience and, and other doctors will do them. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Cock Cockich in 2008, in his one-day lecture of uh, adult orthodontics in the 21st century at the APOC meeting, he, he was asked a question, do you do Kesslings? And he said, for every case, and he wasn't talking about lingual work, he did, that was just a diagnostic study of the case. Um, and he said for every case, but he obviously didn't do them, his technicians, and then he would look at them and, and, and decide um, how the case would go. But here you can see, because we'd done the, the setup model, we had the arch form indiv individualized of the patient, and we could make the wires by measuring, but only with calipers we would measure the distance from the vestibular face to the slot of every tooth. Um, but it, with 2D, you don't compensate the, 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 the in and out thickness. You bond in the model, the, 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 the bracket directly on the model with as little resin as possible. Because if you do put a big, try and make a resin base underneath the bracket, the bracket will invariably slide or move. So actually to hold it in place while you're doing the light cure, you need to push it all the way to the model. Um, so it's very difficult to control how it fits to the lingual surface of the tooth. So what are the myths in lingual on the lab side? And as I said before, a lot of people think the lab system will do nearly all, all or nearly all of the work. And uh, if you've seen my recent video from 2015 explaining this, no, that's wrong. Lab systems do part of the work and they're still lot under the control of the orthodontist. For example, I could position a bracket at a certain tip and then you have an extraction or you have a space to close and you put a force on it that's too strong, you will get tipping. It doesn't matter because your force is stronger than the wire. So, you know, you're going to get bowing, you're going to get tipping, you're going to get all these side effects that you need to control globally with the positioning of the brackets, with the forces that you apply. It's not one aspect of it. It's the whole recipe together, if you like. Um, the brackets are pre-programmed, some people have said. I've been on courses where they say, I'm using a 55 degree torque bracket. I mean, that's that's crazy. There's no pre-programmed brackets in lingual. The only, the only 55 degrees is the angle of the base to the slot from the vertical and that and for me that is calculated the wrong way it should the actual angle of the base from the slot should be towards the face of the tooth which is actually 35 degrees so if you're you're talk, talking about a 55 degree um, um, DTC mini bracket anterior upper anterior or, or an STB which is 55 degree the same it's actually 35 degrees from the slot to the face of the tooth. So that helps get you a good fit. That's all. There's no, you have to think of lingual as edgewise. 
and we do all the programming. The people put in the brackets on the models, whether it's you or whether it's a lab, whether it's an instrument or whether it's by hand, you have to program the bracket slot. So you can imagine now that programming by hand is a lot harder than using an instrument or a wire like the hero setup. So to get 3D, just get this in, in perspective, uh, uh, you need either a hero setup with a wire, or you need instruments, or you need CAD CAM. There's, there's, there's no other way to do it. Um, that is the difference. So what does 3D have that 2D doesn't? In out, as I explained before, and talk programmed into the slot. How do we do this? Customization through a medium which can compensate the uneven surface of the tooth. So on the lingual surface, you've seen the pictures, you know, you, you've seen them in the bath, you know what it's like. It's a very uneven surface. So composite bases are made and the programming is in the composite base. Or if you go to CAD CAM manufacturing, then the base that is made on the CAD system, that will be the customization and where you position your bracket to be welded to the base. That's how you customize the slot in relation to the tooth because torque control will become unmanageable in lingual without proper programming of the slot. How can we do this via indirect bonding and using the right equipment? Just a, a, a demonstration uh, here, um, an example of this. If, if you were bonding a labial bracket, now I think most of the, the, the orthodontists know that in the MBT system, for example, you're meant to be bonding the bracket at the FA point, the midpoint of the, of the clinical crown. But, and they say, actually, in the MBT system, avoid going, you can change the height, but don't go more than half a millimeter more gingival or more in size. Why? Because they know that when you're moving around the curved surface of the tooth, then your pre-programmed torque is changing. But on a, for example, a central incisor or something that's quite flat on its labial anatomy, you, you would have very slight changes. You can see here very slight changes in the torque for two different bracket heights. But when you compare that to the lingual, two different bracket heights in the lingual, you have completely different torque settings. And, and that would become unmanageable. Here's just an example of what we've done and looked at in the lab. Here you can see a Roth bracket fitting to a tooth. This tooth was programmed at 12 degrees with our instruments, 12 degrees of torque. So you can see the Roth bracket fits very nicely to it. It's no space and fits perfectly to the surface. But if you took that same bracket and then tried to bond it to the lingual side, you can see that you have a big wedge of resin, hence the need for the bracket design. And even if we took another bracket like the MBT, which is higher torque, 17 degrees, and you can see that the, the space here, can you see we have a little space for resin? So that tooth has been set at 12 degrees. The bracket is a 17 degrees. That's why you have this little space of resin at the bottom here. But if you turn it upside down and try and bond it to the lingual, then you can still see that we need a big wedge of resin. And you have problems here as well. You would have because of the bracket design. It's not designed for lingual so that you have a problem ligating. Just, just something very obvious. I uh, just want to show you, for example, on a premolar, you see the maximum effect of changing the height of your bracket because it's the most convex surface. So if you put the bracket on the premolar more towards the cusp, the buckle, this is the buckle cusp. As the wire is leveling, then your root will go palatally. So if you put the bracket below the FA point and, and more to the gingival, and then as you level it, the bracket, the root will go buckly. And if you get it in the right position, hopefully you get the root in the center of the arch. 
it's very simple basic stuff um on the lingual side dagmar ibe and dagmar segner wrote a chapter for the second book of dr suzan takamoto invisible orthodontics most people who do lingual will uh, will have this book in their library so everybody can go and look at it and and go back if they if they can't remember this chapter and revise and read this chapter again but they they state here is just a quote from me one of the advantages of fixed orthodontics is that it's possible to apply forces in three directions and apply moments around all three axes one of the most important moments is the third order moment of talk so again you have people studying this and they're saying that one of the most important moments is the third order moment talk um the precise application of talk is important for achieving the correct axial inclination of the teeth with conventional labial techniques but is frequently this is you have to look at the language used frequently absolutely essential in the lingual technique because the vertical position of the incisor ledges of the book or the buccal cus is highly dependent on the third order so how does third order affect second order well i did a, a, a study and i've written a couple of articles which have been published on this and i did my aslo lecture in 2016 on my own study of that and what we found in the lab with the results everything and i'll include a few of those slides here but anybody wants to see that that would be another specialized powerpoint all about talk um so and thomas stam wrote and this is uh, one of the most quoted articles probably in from 2002 i think it was uh, success in lingual orthodontic tr treatment can be achieved only with perfect bracket placement in a controlled laboratory environment using indirect bonding and this this article was done with Gert Weitman and it was all about the the play within the bracket slot and the wire so affecting the talk um especially in lingual orthodontics a close connection exists between talk third order and vertical position second order and he went on to say that this study was not just valuable for the clinician but also for the technician so laboratories can improve by using exactly defined over corrections in second and third order values now that's what i've been doing that's what i've been studying since i ever started in 2004 and within a year or so i was looking at the way we were doing it and once we had the instruments that showed me the error before that there was no instrument showing me the error once i had my instrument showing me the error then it all started to fit together like a jigsaw so the instruments weren't just there for doing the bonding uh and they they were also there to teach so again you have fortunately you know, this keep popping down on my screen <laughs> again in the in the second book from Dr Scuso you have this where, where they say actually that using the TAD device which is the talk angulation device tip and talk can be calculated and compensated but you don't take that away and then they talk about the 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 loss in the talk so if you was at 5 degrees patient treated with a pre amp extraction require extra talk uh this help com compensates for retroclination retro during the space closure mechanics and they talk about the canine talks here you can see uh um a case done by a a uh, a setup model bonding directly on the setup model it's actually bonded with the uh, mac um mushroom bracket positioner from dr emu kyung so it's like the class system which i'm going to show you in a minute and you can see one of the common problems in lingual orthodontics is this dumping of the central incisors they're the ones at the front of the arch they're the ones most affected now the central incisors or some doctors call it rabbiting for obvious reasons have have dumped down even though all brackets were bonded on the same plane on a setup model so then you have to do some complicated wire bending to try and correct this or rebond the brackets 
That's a choice. Why bending or rebonding is a choice. Some some people like to rebond. Um, I it's it's all to do with the taut loss. I know this through my own studies and reading about it. It's all to do because of the taut trap. And the biggest side effect is on the central incisors, and the next will be the lateral incisors because of the arch form. Now. I also believe that it's because the amount of resin they've used here as well that would amplify the biomechanical effect because it makes the circle bigger from the bracket to the incisor ledge. You start a circle from the uh, lingual slot. So even though that was done on a setup with it all on a flat plane wire, that was the effect here, that was the remedy to try and get back to this. So, in this is from my 2016 ESLO lecture, I revisited the phenomenon of torque loss in lingual with my instruments. It's easy to study and it's clear to see the problem. You, you see it very easily with these instruments. Um, and below here, you can see I've bonded or not bonding, I'm just testing a bracket to a tooth, an actual tooth cut from an arch and trimmed and set in lab putty at 12 degrees. No, this one's seven degrees, sorry. Seven degrees, low torque. So I've set it at seven degrees and the height is calculated from the incisor ledge and the instrument is brought down to 3.5 millimeter. And you can see the bracket fits nicely in the middle third of the tooth of the lingual surface and the 55 degree slot angle to base fits nice at 12 degrees and the thickness here is 5.25 from here to the slot okay you can see oh this one's seven degrees this one's low torque sorry this one is low torque so then i go to 12 degrees which is roth prescription first one would have been the same as andrews and here, you can see this as well. This is very important. I average the space between the blade and the tooth to get an average uh, morphology, average torque for the morphology at the FA point. They're always lining the FA point with the center of the blade. And this is how you can see the fit. Fit of the bracket, still very nice further down the tooth. This would be a good position actually for bonding. I like this position. This would be a nice position. But the height is still 3.5 millimeters. So you can see how much further down the lingual surface the tooth has come. So if you're using a round wire, that would extrude that tooth. And then you go to 17 degrees, which is the high torque. And this is interesting because I measured how much the tip of the tooth, the incisor ledge, dropped from there to there. So we measured. And in total, from the, the for every 10 degrees of torque, we were getting about 1.2 millimeters of drop of the incisor ledge. And the bracket actually went further down the lingual surface than that. So if we measured the actual slope on the slope of the lingual surface, the bracket moved and we, we did that. That's another study. I published that as well. And you can see the thickness now is at 7.73. So the thickness is increased. And also, if you look closely, you can see a space between the bracket and the two surfaces. If you have this space and you see this in the mouth and you see a wedge of composite at the top of the bracket, is thicker than the bottom, you can be sure that that bracket was bonded with some sort of degree of high torque. That's how you can tell. But it's a big difference. And this is not working for some reason. Hang on, is it? Yes, oh, there we go, good. So uh, this is just an animation I did, didn't work before. And you can see if you're bonding the bracket and you had a space at the bottom, what would be the effect on the tooth as you level the wire? Okay, move on. Anybody got any questions? Very quiet. So, how do we see torque and use it in orthodontics? Torque is not the labiopalatal angle of the crown. 
of the two. Sorry, cough. This thing. Of me. And this. Yep. Yeah. Just by experience, because this slide I saw already when I did your course. Uh, uh, don't ex it's uh, it's just if you are not speaking with people who have a background in lingual and uh, in uh, laboratory procedure, it can be hard to digest. Yeah, me understand. Uh, I mean, most of I think most of the attendees don't have this background, so uh, it's not something where you can expect a lot of questions because. I remember the first time I saw it, you know, it's a lot to process. And in fact, you understand it really when you start to do the lab work. You know, that's really, the, you know, when you see the variation, you try to, you try to bond your brackets, you see you have a big space, you try to, you know, to flip it down or you, you know, you grind the base uh, or you decide, no, this prescription is not working, it's too sick, it's happened to me several times on the canine. And I change the prescription so that the bracket go Closer, and I tell, okay, I will bend the wire here. Okay, a little more work uh, on the wire, but a, a bracket will come like one millimeter closer. I mean, it's, it mm. was not a small uh, difference. Just telling to the people who are looking, don't think that's so complicated, but it's in fact a lot of information you are giving uh, in uh, one hour. Okay? And in fact, short time. No, it's, um, I know that's reason. something I, I wanted to comment on earlier is that, you know, the people who've done the one-on-one -on -one courses with me or the group courses even, it's over a day that we get the basics. I'm trying to cram in as much as possible for and, and just taking snippets. For, I have many, many PowerPoints that constantly... Yeah, I know, you know, but uh, just... And this is this is the it's, it's the evening it's the evening in China, okay? <laughs> we are Monday. Just understand that perhaps don't make it too dense or you will lost you will lose people during the presentation because they just uh, they just cannot follow uh, up uh, so much. But just saying it's not in fact that complicated, but if you give this amount of information in one hour, you know like today I try to explain to uh, one dentist for half an hour that in fact the prescription I just ask him something as simple when you have a prescription you no know, on a vestibular bracket it's relative to what no, it's, it's, what yes you have an angle you no know, you, you have an angle what are your measure when you measure this angle is it relative to what and in fact the answer is it's relative to the plan of the wire you know, exactly not not the yeah, but plan. the thing is it's if you don't no, if you are not familiar with this kind uh, of uh, concept, which for me now seems very basic, most of what you are saying is it's very hard to follow. Well, in fact, yes, it's, it's purely geometric mathematical. The prescription is not relative to the face. It's relative to the wire because it's a wire who holds the teeth together, okay, and with the frame of reference. And in fact, that's why I was very happy about the video you sent on how to make the, you know, the base uh, flat, because mm -hmm. when you use your device, you realize that, oh, in fact, when I do my setup, if I don't have a good plan of occlusion, uh, you know, because on your lab, when you use your technique, you have to define a plan of occlusion. Yes. Okay. In fact, this is a plan where the wire will be. Okay. And if you don't define the plan of occlusion, you cannot measure the prescription. That's the thing. You know, that's why when... But the point is, I did not understand all this the first day, to be perfectly honest. Okay? And I, I'm not sure it was clear at the end of the five days, of course, it's really by doing. You, know, <laughs> you continue to think about what you, you, you teach, and by doing, by doing, at one point, you realize, oh, yes, that's this. And it seems super obvious, but... This is this is why, you know, I mean, uh, as you say, the course you did five day in lab is very intensive and there's a lot more information. I did two, I did two times five days. <laughs> and, and, and Christian did 13 days with me the first time. I, I imagine that, 13 days all at once. Um, um, and that was very intense because we were we were actually you know coming up with ideas during the course you know as well you know just, just the point here is for the one who listen no it's not that complicated in fact it's it's really not that complicated but at one point you have to do it to really understand and and for you Peter perhaps 
if you try to make more light on the more content. Light. <laughs> okay. No, but no, but just uh, more light because it's not really not that complicated. But if you give so many information, nobody knows that no human brain can assimilate because it's not only uh, they have to try to understand when you speak, and each of the concepts you are telling is not so easy. Because I assure you, even seasoned orthodontists are not so clear about what a prescription is. As a question, even to orthodontists who are around 50, the prescription yeah. is relative to what? And you will see that not so many realize that, in fact, the prescription is just the plan Cook of the book. wire. Cookbook. They've been, they've, been, they've been programmed at university to go Roth or MBT. Or no, no, it's, it's not this. It's, I don't know why, but it's not, I don't remember anyone when I did my master telling me that the prescription, in fact, is relative to the plan of the wire. And yeah. you can tell this is a plan of occlusion, okay? But in fact, when you use your device or when you use insignia, you can you just change the plan of reference that you use. No, you can make, uh, no, instead of making something flat, you can make the, something canted with very close uh, of the gum uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the anterior and close to the occlusal in the posterior. And you say, my prescription is relative to this plan. And this will be this will be the plan of the wire. It will not be the plan of occlusion, but you will have still exactly the same result because yeah. the prescription is relative to the wire. So if you make a prescription for a wire which is canted, yeah, you will have exactly the same thing as if you make a prescription for a wire with flat. I'm going to show that in a minute. <laughs> okay, but it's a one-hour presentation. Okay, yeah. just. Or they, or they will think, oh, it's so super complicated, I cannot do it. When, uh, and uh, that's why I wanted to have the doctor uh, Viet, who have done the lab for 2D for several cases, and uh, who is not, he's not, um, he's not uh, someone who has a deep uh, history uh, in orthodontics. He's a GP, he do orthodontics, but he's not a specialist. And tomorrow he will do the lab for a 3D case, so it's really not that complicated. But understand that in one hour, the amount of knowledge that you can understand assimilate is relatively limited. So don't think this is difficult, this is not. I assure you this is oh. not. I think, I think one of the problems is, is also terminology, that people are drowned with terminology, that they, they forget to think. And, and um, you know, when we come back to basics, I know, I've known professors who have decided to go and do mulligans back to basics course, for example, in, in, in the US. Um, Mulligan, Mulligan is, is, is wonderful. I love the, I love this book, but I also remember the first time I read the book, I was oh, I don't yeah. understand. Just because they want to, they feel lost at some point, you know, because of what they they were taught at university, um, and, and as we say with this sort of cookbook approach, that even terminology like talk, what is talk? Now, if you ask an engineer what talk is, he'll tell you straight away. A physicist still tell you straight away. When you have to ask a dentist or an orthodontist and they start talking about the inclination of the tooth. Well, it's not. Talk is a moment. It's a force. Um, and the, these these diagrams below um, show that. Yeah, there's, there's another thing when you speak, but that's the same again. It's not when you speak with GP because it's the same thing when you speak with orthodontist. Uh, we are not speaking talk. In fact, we are speaking... I told them very basically, where do you want the root to be at the end of the, uh, at the, end mm -hmm. of the treatment and what kind of movement you want? And just torque usually means you don't move, the crown does not, does not move and it's a root who is uh, moving. But in fact, no, when you change the bracket to change the mesiodistal angulation of the root, you are doing mechanically exactly the same thing as when you do a torque on the interior. Mm. Yep. I mean, mechanically, it's exactly the same thing. It's, it's just not the same uh, word, and that's an issue. That's why I understand when they tell they want to go back to basic at people like Mullingan, because Mullingan, he don't use, I mean, he's really very, he understands his mechanic, he understands what he's doing. Whereas when you start to use torque and angulation, in fact, uh, for me, I, I would say, some, very often I have the impression to speak with people who don't really understand what they are telling, okay? 
like they use torque, like uh, like if it was meaning something. I want to keep the torque in my teeth. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it means you want to make a translation. Okay, but yeah. you don't keep torque. That's that yeah. makes no sense. Okay. Yeah. So, he, thanks, Nicholas. That's very important. And just you know, I try and tell people imagine that you're trying to um, open a door by its hinges. And that's what you're doing with your slot, your wire in your slot. Hi there. So, as we can see, torque is one of the major unseen factors when cases turn out with different heights. We've already looked at those photos earlier. Why? It's because of the circle. If you take the center of the bracket slot, as the center of your circle to the incisor ledge, it's a bigger circle than with this. So the more distance you have and the more composite you put on, the more effect you will get here. So the more that the, the, the tooth will drop in the second order. So the, the more error with the torque or the torque trap between your wire and your bracket, if you don't use the, you can position the bracket at the right torque, but if you don't use the right wires, you have to expect that you're going to get some loss. So with the 1622 wire in an 1825 slot, you're going to get about 11 degrees of, of torque loss. So you have to calculate this. 11 degrees of torque loss on a central incisor in lingual will mean uh, about 1.2 millimeters of second order effect. So we have to look at this as well and then compensate. Now with, with my system, we can actually compensate that because we, rather than bonding everything at the same height, if I know that I'm going to have a, 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 a torque loss with a 1622 wire on a retraction, um, then I could bond those brackets slightly more incisal. So if I say, well, I'm going to have a five degree torque loss, for example, I could bond the bracket half a millimeter more incisal, which will help compensate for this rabbiting effect, um, or one millimeter more incisal. And, and these are the things that you can do because with the BPD, you're bonding each tooth individually. So even if you bond directly from a setup onto a setup with the BPD, which you can do, um, then, then you're gonna, you're gonna, um, bond at different heights you can rather than bonding with the wire the hero technique or bonding with a a, a plate like in the in the in the uh, class technique or the mushroom bracket position this is just an example if we got the torque wrong this was a case this is part of the lecture from eslo 2016 where the torque was the the case was sent to me and i measured it and it was actually minus 1.5 on the molar on the 26 so I've cut the model at the back here just to give a representation. And um, if I applied minus nine, which is the standard prescription in many lingual systems, then you would see this bigger space and then I would move my two to fit to minus nine. If I move my two to fit to that pre-prescribed torque that somebody's arbitrarily said we should use, in this particular case, which is a narrow basal arch, then the root would probably go buckle to the buckle. So we have to think about this, and this is what happened in one of the cases, which I include in that PowerPoint about talk from Dr. Mauricio in, in Ercosi in Brazil. He sent me a case which he'd done with Harmony and the seven, that this was what, what was happening with the seven. And I believe it was through uh, 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 the wrong prescription of talk rather than the prescription to the patient that we're using a prescription so if you don't want the posterior teeth to move maybe they're in good occlusion in an adult case and most lingual orthodontics is our adult cases then you should think about either using bi-dimensional technique or surveying the model to find out what your teeth actually are what 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 degree of torque they're expressing or degree of inclination, sorry, from the, the, the arch. So I've measured cases which are um, um, 
uh, are, are narrow basal arches, tapered arches, and all the teeth in the arch have been in positive inclination towards the buccal or towards the vestibular. So none of the teeth are in negative inclination. So if I applied an MBT prescription, for example, of minus 14 on a molar, I would be prescribing the wrong, wrong talk for that, for that case. Because if the patient's got good occlusion, why would you want to change it? So one way to get around that would either be to be measure it and then program your bracket through indirect bonding at the torque you want, which is passive, or use a bi-dimensional technique and use a larger slot in the posteriors so that you don't get the torque effect. As we said before, it's all about this angle, the slot to the base. Now this says 55, that's what they prescribe it at, but 55 is actually from the vertical. So if you're looking from the slot, that is a 35 degree angle here. So uh, now we're on the subject of brackets. We just look at, uh, at some, some things with the brackets. And this is an excerpt from the book, New Approach to Lingual Orthodontics, which was actually a, a composition of the, um, of the uh, WSLO um, meeting in, in Argentina. It's actually one of the few that I missed since 2006. I think I've been to most of them, but I missed that one for some reason. And um, they, they're talking about what, what is a desirable characteristic in a lingual bracket. And one of the characteristics they describe here is nickel-free alloy. And, and this could be quite important um, if the brackets are in, in the mouth for a long time, say two years or more, um, that you have patients who are allergic to nickel. And here I show a photo at the bottom of a DTC mini bracket, and they are 17.4 stainless pH stainless steel brackets. This is one thing that worries me a bit, and this is used in one of the CAD CAM systems. Um, oh, and they say their brackets are, uh, um, are biocompatible and they are a titanium based alloy. But when I actually searched up the alloy that they use, Tiladium, from the company Tiladium, an alloy called Tylite, it is not a titanium alloy. That's, that's obvious to anybody who's got any experience in metallurgy. And you can look here and you can see nickel. What is the content? 60 to 76% nickel. That is a nickel-based alloy. That is not a titanium-based alloy when you own only 4 to 6%. So I think you have to be very careful and, and, and look at the details and scrutinize what type of system you're going to use, um, whether it's CAD-CAM or whether it's a, a manufactured bracket. You need to demand what, what, what are they made from so that you can go and reference that alloy and, and look at the details. What is a 17.4 pH stainless steel? Well, it's uh, precipitated hardened stainless steel and, and they're very commonly used in things like turbines on, on planes, so that means they're very strong. They're used in marine applications, that means they're very, um, uh, they have good resistance to corrosion uh, with things like salt water and stuff. And uh, we've got Here you can see the, the process of how it comes together and you can see the different temperatures, etc. And they used that, um, okay, it's okay, I'm just getting a message here from somebody on my phone. <laughs> Sorry for that. All alloys have different properties according to the composition and structure and 17.4 only has a 3% nickel content. And we put different... Uh, elements into an alloy for different reasons. So if you need an alloy that's more malleable and more uh, easier to work uh, uh, and softer, you will put more nickel in, more beryllium and stuff like that. But in Europe, as um, for the last more than a decade or so that I've worked in, in, in prosthodontics before, the nickel was banned in all crown and bridge alloys. So we have to think about this as well. And beryllium was banned before that because of the effect on the 
people working with the alloys, technicians. So it's just something I wanted to add there that maybe you've not thought about and that you should think about. Uh, this is a, a, an image of DTC's own brackets, the mini lingual, which I've worked with year, for years. I worked with ORG before, and we know that most of the people at DTC are from ORG company. And uh, when they set up, they took the designs along with them and started making the brackets there, which I was very happy about because I've always found them a good, reliable bracket. Uh, I knew that the alloy composition was good they're a little bit hard i must say um so when you have to bend the hook you have to be careful because you can break it but you can bend them i use two sets of pliers to bend the hooks um and and you know you'll get used to it but when you bend it you have to think about whether the slot will close so you must check it like i said uh, use a stainless steel wire and just slide it through the slot make sure your slot dimension hasn't shown uh, changed when you modify a bracket in any way um, but they they're, they're nice brackets and uh, now they make a all 018 slot which I wanted for years and now they do it but you still have the option of the bi-dimensional kit which is 022 in the posterior which was Rafi Romano's original and Sylvia Geron's original design um, you can mix brackets up when you're bonding on the lingual here, you'll see a picture. I put some labial brackets on premolars, which is possible. Maybe not so comfortable for the patient with the double wing here and the double slot. So you can, if on a, on a something like a premolar or a molar, you could actually use um, some labial brackets if you need to. Um, on this, I did it because I needed a 018 slot. I needed complete control over the torque in the buckle sectors and I didn't have any other brackets that were 018 slot. Sometimes you have to cut the hook off, which you can. You can remove the hook with a carborundum disc and then use a rubber stone to polish it. And it looks rather like the STB second generation. But if it's too close with the gingiva or, or you have a prominent gingiva, then, then the hook is difficult, you can't bend it out of the way, then you can always remove the hook if you don't need it. And some doctors like me to remove the hooks just for comfort. Some of them wanted me to remove the hooks on all anteriors, incisors, not the canines, just the incisors, on every case. Here you can see um, one of the problems in lingual orthodontics is the interbracket distance. So that when you get a lower model like this, um, the actual free wire between each bracket is very small on the lingual orthodontics compared to the labial. I think it's about 35, 40%, something like that, when compared, smaller. So, um, and then when you've got your ligation module, it makes the distance. So if you look at distance B between the brackets, you have to think about when it's ligated, it now becomes distance A. So small, light wires will behave in, in, a, in a different way. They will become stiffer. Um, this, is, this is a common effect. So that's why we use smaller wires in the lingual technique. But with the new Nintendo bracket, we, uh, we, we're getting around some of this problem. This is when I designed it, I thought about this. So uh, I needed the bracket to be small, um, to be smooth, rounded, self-ligating, definitely. And, but the door, the self-ligating door is smaller than the actual body of the bracket. So that means the amount of trapped wire is smaller. So the distance between the brackets here is the a free wire is the blue line, not the yellow line. So the actual free wire distance is more. So in, in, in the anterior brackets, they're all the same, upper and lower, only the slot to base angle changes. And we have a different uh, base angle to slot in our upper brackets to everybody else. So we can get them more gingival and they're closer fit to the teeth uh, in the gingival third. And this is why we have this uh, large ligation wing here, which is rounded for the tongue so that it can avoid when we get very gingival, it doesn't sit on the tissue. 
it allows us some space. Because it's always a good idea to have these ligation wings, even on a self-ligating bracket, just in case you want to partially ligate, or if something does go wrong in the future, and, and, and you know, you have doors come off, off um, some of the clip type uh, self-ligating brackets, people are telling me, oh, well, the doors failed on 20% of the brackets, you know, they broke or, uh, and that's why they all have ligation wings and people incorporate that. But also so that you can attach various auxiliaries to them. Um, you know, um, Dr. Mark Wertheimer did ask me uh, if we were thinking of putting a hook, having an option of a hook on the canines because he thought it might be a good idea for um, uh, using with auxiliaries. So that's uh, uh, part of the reason that we did the design of the Nintendo self-ligating bracket like this. And you can see here um, is the pre these, these are the premolar brackets and we're comparing, you know, with the uh, ligated bracket the STB second generation, probably one of the smallest ones, but how, at the actual amount of wire trapped in our bracket is less than, than, than the STB. And we have a two millimeter door on the premolar and the body width is 2.7 millimeters. And compared to the Tomy Clippy or the uh, GC, it's the same bracket. Um, Tomy make them and GC sell them as well. Um, then you have the clip which covers here 3.3 3 .3 millimeters, the whole slot width. Um, so you're going to get a little bit more friction from that bracket. Plus it's an active clip rather than a passive self-ligation slot. There's just some pictures of uh, lingual brackets uh, over the years from 7th generation STB and you have different, different uh, uh, slot angles, 40 degree, 55 degree, uh, the Edenta, the Edenta self-ligating, uh, American Orthodontics, Stealth bracket, and the Fujita bracket. And then on the wire, you can see how the profile of these brackets, how they look on the wire. So you can see which ones are more bulky, seventh generation, obviously less comfortable for the patient, but um, maybe more workable for the doctor in some some aspects because easier to put on various auxiliaries so i've done the same thing here with our uh our bracket compared to the gc and the tomi and you can see that the premolar bracket is quite small in depth compared to the other brackets this is the stb second generation and this is the 3br and also it's about hygiene so if you've got a clip like this, you've got areas where the food can go down and around the clip here, you've got pro possible problems. Um, we, we look for rounded brackets, you know, we're looking for smooth contours so that you can avoid, uh, yeah, you can have better hygiene and, and it's friendlier to the tongue. So when you put ligation modules on, you've also got to think about the hygiene there and, you know, any food traps, etc. There's some of the brackets. This is an example of CAD CAM. It just shows you this is a nice photo, both from uh, Dirk Weitman, obviously, his new system Win, compared to his old system Incognito, who 3M now have after they bought it from him. Um, just so that you get an idea of what the brackets look like. Uh, they were mainly ribbon wires. The new passive self-ligating design is easy to use. It's a sliding. I actually did this design in 2006, called it the guillotine. And as far as I know, it was done before the Damon brackets were done as well. Um, and, but I never, never did anything with the design. I didn't commercialize it or anything. And you have a sliding bracket, but it, a sliding uh, passive door but it, it's different in a way because it only it will only have a, a three-point contact on the wire so it should reduce friction as well rather than a four-door contact um smooth contours rounded rounded edges a new slot size 1725 is the maximum so it forces you to use small uh, smaller wires lighter forces um 
and the, uh, the new slot base angle, which allows us to get a closer fit, and obviously at a great price. So here you can see down near the gingival of a tooth, we would normally have a space at the top of the bracket here, but it fits very closely to the tooth at that new slot angle. And you can see some of the bonding that we've been doing. That's with a 16 round wire on the model. So I don't know where all these scratches are coming from. It looks like somebody's been drawing on the screen. <laughs> ah. So here's a case from a recent case from Dr. Enrique Valdetero in Brazil. The lab work was done by himself using his usual method with his slot machine instrument, as you can see, which is a very close to the targ and, and, and which I'm going to show you in a minute, the, the instruments and, uh, and uh, um, the TAD and BPD or TTS. And here you can see the progression was very quick for this crowded case um, with the new Nintendo brackets. So it's two months and 20 days he's got to there. Still work in progress, but, but from there to there in two months and 20 days. And as you can see, he's ligated all of the brackets there. He's got the wire in. So in the 3D, you started, we originally had the uh, class system which was the Customized Lingual Appliance Setup Service. Uh, was developed with Ormco and a lab in America called Speciality Appliances. Basically, they did a Kessling setup and then bonded the brackets to a wire plane. This is how they did it in the top photos, using a plate on a standard type um, dental surveyor that held a plate, modified to hold a plate, and you had the adjustable base here. So you could set the plane and then bond the posterior brackets and another plate for the anterior brackets. It looks easy. I, I had a go with a, a similar instrument, though, and it's not so easy bonding several brackets at once. One, um, to clean them, and two, I, I found that the brackets came off the model when you tried to remove the plate. So it's much easier to bond bracket by bracket um, this is another reason the beep, I stuck with the design um, from Dr. Filion with the calipers and just modified that to be the BPD um, part of the, of the set of instruments that we will bond with. And there you can see a mini tarb being used or the, the model checker now by Sure called it mini tarb back in those days. And this is the mushroom bracket positioner, which is another variation. It's gone through a progression um, where they use an instrument similar to the class, but uh, which holds a wire where they can put all the brackets on the wire. So it's like a mechanical hero technique. And left bottom here, you see the hero technique, which is all done by hand, no special equipment. And you do a setup and you use a wire pre-bent and then use that wire to bond your brackets to the model. So it's all about creating a wire plane, as we talked about with Dr. Nicholas earlier. Um, techni techniques were developed using the plates, and uh, you can find those in Chapter 15, Lingual Orthodontics, Rafi Romano, uh, and in some more modern books as well. Um, they have references to it. The Dentos book is a very good book, uh, with lots of information in there. Um, and they show you. This is how I do my setups. Uh, you can see I've got photos in the background of the patient printed. I don't print them anymore. I look at the computer screen. You know, we want to be f environmentally friendly, so we don't want to be printing lots of paper. Um, I make sure that the doctor gives me the, the lab forms all filled in correctly. If they don't fill them in with the right information, I will send them emails and they have to uh, explain in the email to me. I have the master models. I do occlusograms that I can follow. I have my uh, setup here, and I start with the teeth in the original position. I never start a setup with my teeth on the bench using uh, uh, an arbitrary template. I start with them in the original position like the doctor will in the mouth, and then see what I can do within the limits of expansion 
IPR, etc. Proclination, we will do expansion, proclination, IPR, retroclination, whatever we need to do to get the arch form. Um, but then you can see um, within the physiological limits of the, of, of the arch form, what, how much we're expanding, you know, what's the anterior arch width, how much it changes. Um, we look for minimal changes, obviously, within the guidance of the doctor's uh, prescription. Um, um, you know, especially um, posterior arch width, you don't want to be moving the molar. The molar's expanding more than maybe one and a half millimetres, uh, two millimetres, you know, uh, across the arch. You know, I look for minimal, minimal movements in the adult cases. And here you can see in just another example. And this is, you can see, a narrow arch. So the teeth are all slightly reclined to keep the roots in the bone. A lot of crowding on the lower here. We've done some IPR. There will have been some IPR on the premolars, etc., as well. And these are like the occlusograms we use. So I'll do it over the a scan of the, the master model, and then I can compare the movements over the setup model, how much I've moved. And, and doing a setup gives me a, an individual arch form, but sometimes doctors are only doing one arch. So it, it becomes almost, to me, imperative then that I do the setup to the existing arch to know what I'm working with. Um, rather than work on some arbitrary arch form. I don't believe in, in arch form templates. Um, they can act as a guide, but the patient's arch form is individual and should be uh, treated as such. And the BPD, as I said, can be used to bond directly on a model. We choose a wire plane and we can bond the brackets without changing the height of the instrument. So we choose a plane and we can go around the whole arch and we can bond brackets either labelly or lingually. Here's a couple of examples you can see I've done here. Set it at a, at a plane, the setup model, chosen a height, and here you can see they're quite in size, all the brackets here, but the premolar bracket is very gingival. And this is why we had to find our premolar height first and then use that same plane and go around the arch. Um, and any any slight discrepancies the composite will take between the morphology and the bracket base. Or we can do the same and we can bond directly on the setup model with the lingual. So it's like a hero setup if you like, but with the option we can change the height for compensation here. So if we know we've increased the torque by 10 degrees or usually five degrees now, we can bond the bracket half a millimeter more in size up to reduce this effect. And I did this model as an example, which I take around on courses now. I bonded the brackets with seventh generation because they're nice and big, easy to see, easy to work with. Um, and I had them left over stock in the lab. And um, and we, we bonded this and then I removed the wax from the anterior section of the model so that on a round wire, we can see how height changes when I rotate the bracket around the wire. So when I change the inclination of the tooth, how much it shows you the vertical discrepancies. And it's an excellent tool. So even modern CAD CAM systems also use setup. Originally, Incognito did um, manual setup. Now it'd be a digital setup. Although I've been told Dr. Weichmann has gone back to doing a manual setup on the wind system. So for no, actually not, manufacturing. He was, is that, he's, doing, he's, doing, uh, he's doing manual setup, or at least when I was working with them, they were doing manual setup. And uh, first he told, he told us during the certification, and second, me, I sent him a CL file, because uh, he accepted a CL file. And they sent me back a manual setup. In fact, they printed my CL file, they duplicated it. Yeah, to have a model, and they did a manual setup. They they sent me back with uh, the appliance. So yes, they did a manual setup. And Wickman explained why, uh, because it's more precise when uh, they look at it. 
me, I think it's more, perhaps I am mistaken, but uh, 